welcome back. We've gotten some feedback that I should, number one, point with my mouse and not with my fingers, right, for the sake of the people who are watching remotely. So I will try to remember to do that. And also to please ask questions on the, using the microphone, which Brian is waving around back there. Uh, and that I should repeat them in any event in case you don't. So, so hopefully we'll all try to do that. So my goal today is to finish the lecture three, which I began last time, which is a grand overview of all parallel architectures that are of interest, only some of which you'll be programming in this class. There's a much bigger variety, as shown here. And to give you some idea of the costs and benefits of using any of them. So because what is easy to do in parallel and fast and efficient on one architecture may be much slower on another. And, and so we don't want to go into all the details in every machine, but a high level view will be important so that you can pick it. Um, so there's programming models, which is how your, what your code looks like, what your software looks like. That's on the one side. On the other side, you have machine models, how the hardware uh, looks at a high level. And of course, there's a mapping between one and the other. And historically, people have built machines and, and the programming models just kind of go together. They matched. So whatever the hardware instructions were appeared in the language. That has grown apart over time, so that you can, because people are tired of changing their programs every time a new computer architecture comes out. So, there, so many of these languages are portable, but still, if you write code and don't pay attention to what the underlying costs are, it may be that when you move it to another machine, it doesn't work very well. So anyway, so what we've done so far is the stuff in dark at the top. We talked about shared memory. That's your, the multi-core chips in all your laptops. And there were three different programming models for that. Shared memory, so think p-threads, that's the most common kind of model. You'll be doing homework in that. So you have private variables and shared variables, and everybody can refer to them. And they're different so-called threads, subroutines that are all running in parallel. And they get mapped to the different cores, and you don't have to pay attention to how that works. Then there was another class, which were multi-threaded processors, which actually shared resources like multipliers and adders at an even finer grain to keep everybody busy. But your code still looked the same. It was still the same point with the mouse, shared memory model. And then there was another attempt to uh, build even larger machines, because these don't scale up very far, 32 processors or something like that. So people wanted to build bigger ones because they like to write these kinds of programs. And they finally got up to about 512. But the memory had to be distributed. There couldn't be one chunk of memory that everybody referred to. And so they had to do a lot of work building directories to keep track of who owned what. So, but that stops scaling. So the next topic, where the really big machines are built, is um, message passing. And I began talking about this last time. And so that is the situation where the only, so all the machines are, have independent memories, and the only way they can communicate is by you explicitly, say, calling a subroutine, which says, please send a message, send mail to my neighbor, it's cheaper than mail, fortunately, and send them this data, and that other processor has to execute a receive, open the mail, and say, oh, I've gotten some data, now I know what to do. That's the message passing programming model. And there's a, a very well-established standard called MPI, message passing interface, that you can program in. It's quite portable. And there's a variety of different piece, kinds of hardware that people have built over time to try to accommodate that. And so let me, let me continue. So here I did the slide before. This is the message passing model. Um, so there's a bunch of processors. And they are shown here in these boxes. They all have a number of, all the data is private. So you can't refer directly to anybody else's data. So your variable i is your own. And this guy's variable i is his own. And if you want to communicate, you have to call a subroutine which says send data item s to processor 1. Processor n might do that. And processor 1 has to say please receive data from processor n. And there's a lot of variations on this. So you can sort of open anybody's mail. You don't have to say it. I'm only going to take processor ends. There are a bunch of, so now let's get on to the machines. That, that was the programming model. So programming model, that's what your software looks like. So now it's what the hardware looks like. And there are many machines that look like this. So uh, these are, in fact, historically the dominant ones on the, on the large side because they're the easiest to build. And you're going to be doing your homework on them. So the Franklin and the older machine up at, up at LBL. Um, uh, Hopper is the new one. Franklin's the old one. Uh, there have been a bunch of clusters in the EECS department here, Millennium, Citrus. So they're all distributed memory machines, even if the individual node is a shared, is a shared memory machine, a little you know, four-core, eight-core cluster. So, and this is what it looks like from the hardware point of view. There's a processor. There's a memory. There's an interconnect. And every processor is connected to a network interface chip or card or processor. 
And so this processor here is specially built to take care of all of the message passing. So the processor can go on, keep computing, and, it, and this is the, uh, the post office, and it sends all the data to the post office, and it takes care of all the interfacing with everybody else so they can run in parallel. So it tries to let you compute so the processor doesn't have to slow down while the messages are being sent around the network. And, you know, the network connects everybody. And exactly who's connected to whom faster or slower, you know, you have near neighbors, far neighbors, the network tries to hide that all from you. So uh, historically, this took off back in, um, I think this was 1994, and a person um, named uh, Tom Sterling, who's shown in the picture, realized that, yes, question? Sorry. Uh, quick question. Can you go back to the slide? Yes. So the, the Franklin and Hopper clusters, are, they look like they're commodity CPUs. Yes, and, and, and my next slide is the point this took off when people realized you could build parallel computers not by having special purpose hardware for everything, which is what people did up until the beginning of the 90s, but just build by commercial stuff and glue it together. And, you, and it was incredibly cheap. And so indeed, the processors on Franklin and Hopper are, let's say, AMD Opterons, and I think also some Intel platforms, I kind of forget which is which, that you would buy and put in your laptop. Uh, but there, they buy thousands of them and glue them together. With some, and, and to do that, there is some special purpose, obviously, hardware that needs to be built by the manufacturer to make them all talk together quickly. But they just rely on companies like Intel and IBM and AMD to build the individual chips. You know, it's a division of labor that works very well economically. But before that, you know, supercomputers were built, you know, all special purpose. And so this took off really in the early 90s when this gentleman realized you could buy, you know, go to Fry's, whatever it was called back in 1994, and buy as many of these things as you want and glue them together over an internet, which you could also buy at the same store. And then all he had to do was supply some software tools so you could write message passing software. And this let things take off. This was not necessarily very fast. You know, internet is not, everybody can't talk to everybody at the same time. But it sort of led to a, a big boom in this stuff. And so the boom is such that, and I'm sorry, this is 2009 data. If you look at the top 500 list, the 500 fastest computers in the world, about 82% of them are built out of clusters like this. So that is certainly the dominant architecture for big machines. Because, as I said, they're the most economical things to build. You just buy lots and lots of commodity processors, and you might have to build some special purpose interconnect, but you, know, you, you leverage off of the investments of the Intels and AMDs of the world. And so back in 9, 2002, the biggest number two machine in the world was a cluster. It had cell processors, it had game processors, those were the fastest things you could buy at the time. And so take advantage of the huge game market and the investment in there. And it also had dual core AMD Opterons to glue them together. And of course now, I think the fastest machine is built out of, again, different kind of game, game processors, GPUs from NVIDIA. So yes, and we'll have a separate lecture on that, of course. Um, uh, Okay, and I will repeat your question. So I think in Duke they were able to make a supercomputer out of PlayStation 3. Recently they are, maybe not recently, but they stopped enabling that somehow. So, um, so you're saying that uh, Duke built a supercomputer out of PlayStation 3s, but that became difficult later because of the change in the architecture of PlayStation? Yeah. So at one point, I believe there was, and, and maybe... Brian can correct me if I'm wrong. When they put out PlayStations, the, the uh, uh, yield on the fab line was such that it was, they could only make enough of them economically to sell if seven processors out of eight worked, and they didn't worry about the eighth one being broken. Was that was that, that one, or is that a different one that I'm remembering? And so if you want to build a machine... Uh, 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 so when people were building supercomputers, they wanted to pay extra and make sure all eight processors worked. And so there was sort of this economic obstacle to continuing to build things that way. Also, and so, Sony kind of locked down the, the, the motherboard, so you couldn't actually load up Linux on it anymore. Ah, OK. There's so, another story. Yeah, the, there was a patch that came through on the firmware that they pushed out. And uh, the, previously, Sony was OK with people taking off their operating system, putting on your own operating system, and you know, running it as your own computer. And then they took that away. Because people were using it to put hacks in the back end, to hack, you know, to crack games. So in order to protect the software part of the shop, they disabled the hardware in a way. So um, now, when you want, so now as a result, you, these are all disabled chips that come on PlayStations. You can't actually put up new material because the firmware stops it. 
So, so, so an so analogous uh, thing that uh, happened in, a few years ago is that people tried to have a contest to get in the top 500, and they just invited people to show up with particular kinds of laptops, and they would glue them all together on the fly in a school gym. And I'm not sure how high they got on a list by doing that particular contest, but people have tried various things to build their own machines on the fly that exist for one day in order to factor a large matrix to get on the list. And then they all go home. So, um, so let me continue to the next sort of, sort of popular version of parallel computing. Um, so this was clusters. And the next example is basically everybody's laptop in the world connect, or, or desktop connected by the internet. And this is widely used, for example, to look for aliens. Now, if you ever uh, watched the movie uh, Contact with Jodie Foster, that was based on a project, you know, the, the intellectual background of that was a project that was invented here at Berkeley called SETI at Home, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So the idea is that there are all these very large telescopes around the world, which are collecting you know, information, radio telescope information. And what this organization does is it breaks them up into tiny little pieces, and you can sign up your laptop or your, your desktop to download as many of them as you want and do pattern recognition on them. You download the pattern recognition software and look for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence, sort of patterns that couldn't come up by random stuff that goes on you know, in the cosmic microwave background radiation. And so uh, this has grown to be 500,000 PCs around the world. And they have a web page where you can compete for how many hours you put on. So there's a lot of sort of sociology and getting people to be willing to sign up. And it gets about 1,000 CPU years per day. I think this data is a little bit old. And this has been so successful that many other people have adopted the idea. And if you Google either volunteer computing or BOINC, which stands for the Berkeley Open Infrastructure for Network Computing. People fold proteins this way. You can sign up your, your laptop to do you know, computational chemistry and computational biology. People do uh, you know, math. I, one of the early projects in this was called the Great Merzen Prime Search. You know, people tried to factor numbers to find large primes. And so this works if you need almost no communication between subprocesses, right? Everybody gets a little chunk of radio telescope data. It can be analyzed locally, no communication, and the answer sent back. Yes, an alien, no, an alien. And, and so there's, there's actually, and then of course, uh, they don't trust you to actually do this correctly because you want the publicity of having found aliens. So what they do is that they send out every uh, chunk of, of data several times. And if everybody agrees there's an alien, then they will look at it. So uh, to avoid cheaters. So this is yet another form of distributed computing, and it scales up much larger than any existing supercomputers, but it has to be low communication. And uh, the, as I said, the inventor is here at Berkeley. He's at Space Sciences Lab, David Anderson. So here is another programming model, because people find it painful to write code where you have to write special subroutine calls to send data and to receive data. But that's the way the machines are going to be built. They're going to have distributed memory hardware. And so this next programming model is an attempt to compromise to give you a shared memory-like programming model that still runs on distributed memory machines. And it's called a global address space. And there are a number of, of and you'll do one homework assignment in a language that gives you this programming model. And so when you run your program, you have a certain number of threads, independent subroutines. And if you have a you know, 64 processor machine, you will have 64 of these threads when your program starts up. And as in the shared memory model, you have a bunch of local variables that are just yours. You know, you refer to I, it's just your copy of I. But you can also declare some variables, and that's shown down here. So there are you know, n plus one processors, and each one has a local copy of I. And then there are other variables you can declare to be shared. So everybody owns the array S. I mean, everybody's allowed to refer to the array S. So when processor zero refers to S sub zero, and that's local in its memory, it just goes and gets it, it's very fast. But if, it, if processor zero refers to S sub one, it, no, it, will look, it will do a little arithmetic and realize, oh, S sub one is stored on my neighbor, it's not mine. And that network interface card will automatically go get S sub one from the neighbor. So your code looks the same, S sub one, S sub zero, however you want to refer to it, but sometimes it'll be slow and sometimes it'll be fast. And so, so you still have to be knowledgeable about where your data lives so that you write fast code and you don't spend all your time referring to you know, S sub some things that are on a distant processor. But you know, it, it's much nicer to write because it's not cluttered with send subroutines and receive subroutines. And so uh, languages include uh, unified parallel C. That was invented here. That's what you're going to do your homework in. Uh, titanium, core array, Fortran. There's a variety of these things. And so, this is, uh, base, and so this is sort of the machine model that goes with that, and it, it's the same one as before. But it, it, rely, it can take advantage of some extra hardware that they actually put in the network interface chip, because this is an attractive thing to do. 
So this looks the same as we did before. Every processor has its own private memory. That's all there is. There's an interconnect, and then there's this little extra network interface card. And so it turns out that there's special instructions on some of these, so that in order for uh, to go into this memory, these processes, so, so if I refer to S sub 1, if processor 0 refers to S sub 1, and that's over here, then the network interface card will just go do a read. It'll talk to this network interface card, get the data, and never bother that processor. So it won't slow down. It all happens invisibly to the programmer. You can imagine terrible race conditions, right? You have to program carefully. But that means that you can have all of these, you know, get data from my neighbor, put data in my neighbor's memory. So processor 0 could write S sub 1. It could change the data in that memory by doing a put. And processor 1 won't know about it necessarily until he goes look at S and looks at S sub 1 again. And so there's special purpose hardware that's been designed on a number of platforms to do this. OK, so that's the end of what? Sorry, let me try this again. Why did it do that? Sorry, it's my machine is Microsoft PowerPoint has encountered a problem. All right, let me reopen the file. Sorry. So we have, uh, that's not my slide. So while I'm fiddling with uh, this wonderful software, does anybody have a question? So let me just go reopen the original file. Apologies. So do you want to take a moment and talk about the um, uh, homework while I'm just redoing this? The, assi the, um, the assignment of teams, what we're going to do. Okay, maybe Brian can, can do that. Um, I am working on right now on uh, making teams for homework one based on your responses to the Survey Monkey survey. And um, don't bother completing it now if you haven't filled it out because I won't look at it yet. Um, but uh, what will happen is you will, I will post online a list of people and teams and you'll be responsible for getting track of, of your teammate. And if you can't find that person or if you're dropping the class, or if they're dropping the class, you guys talk amongst yourselves and decide whether or not you actually have a team, and then email me, letting me know if you actually need a new teammate or something. Um, I'll post more news on the website. Thank you. Yes, right. OK, so back in business, the next uh, uh, pairing of a programming model and a machine model that goes with it is called data parallel. OK, so in this case, let's, let's talk about the programming model first, what your code looks like. Your code will consist of a bunch of lines of code of the form very simple, A equals B plus C, except B and C will consist of long arrays, and it'll all happen in parallel. So think MATLAB, right? This is, you know, this is a nice programming model. As long as you can construct all of your you know, big parallel operations to, be, to map to the underlying instructions, like add two arrays that are supported by, by, the, uh, by the architecture. So usually you're not going to just add two big arrays. You're going to have to you know, work on subsets of the data, and they're going to be shifted around. So there needs to be uh, you know, various you know, constructs to refer to subarrays or, or subdata structures. And uh, if, so for example, if you put a, a big array across many, many processors and another array across the same processors, adding them can be done locally, no communication. But what if you want to add the first half of the first array to the second half of the second array? then all of a sudden communication has to happen. That's invisible to you. The language and the programming model will take care of that automatically for you, but it may go a lot more slowly, right? So it's, it's, you still have to be aware of it, even though the language, you know, you, you'd still write the same code. So it's easy to understand to think about what it does, but you know, not all problems map so naturally onto this. And so here's kind of what the hardware looks like. So that's the programming model. And the hardware model looks like a bunch of processors, a bunch of local memories, a bunch of network interfaces, and an interconnect. But all these processors are, are slaves. 
They're all being run by one centralized control processor, which is executing your sequential looking program and telling all these other processors to add, you know, sub contiguous subsets of the big array that you want to add. Right? So, so you're just thinking about writing programs, you know, for this control processor that's a nice sequential processor, and it's divvying up all the work to all these parallel ones that are all doing, in the simplest case, the same thing at the same time on a different subset of the data. And for a long time, this is how the biggest machines were built. And here are some names, the Connection Machine 2, MassPar. And you had to trust the compiler to sort of look at your code and figure out where all the data should be stored and who was going to be responsible for you know, doing what. And that's a big demand on the compiler. And they couldn't quite keep up with all the complexity that people wanted. So here's another model of, of data parallel. And it's called vector machines. And these were the fastest machines in the world for a while, like Cray vector computers, if you remember that. Then they sort of died out for a while, and now it's kind of coming back uh, in the form of GPUs. And so um, here, there was a single control processor. An individual instruction would say, please add this very long array to this very other long array. But where was that data? That data lived in a register. So there was a register of length 32 words or 64 words, and there was a single instruction which would say, add this, this 32-word register to this 32-word register, you know, component by component. And so there was lots and lots of parallelism. That was sort of the underlying instruction set. And of course, you didn't have to add all 32. You could add a subset if you wanted. And so, um, and so the instructions would say, please do 32 or 64 things at a time. But then there was a lot of flexibility in the hardware. You know, maybe they could only do eight at a time, but it would all be invisible to you. And the architecture would just sort of map your 64 down to the eight. And so this had, that died away for a while because it was so much cheaper to go you know, buy you know, desktop computers and wire them together with, with Ethernet. But it's been coming back. And so it's, again, in all your laptops, it's called the SSE2 instruction set in an Intel platform. And there's a, a similar name for this instruction set in an AMD platform. So in that case, you can add, you know, not 64 or 32. They're down at the 248 level. Single instructions will do that many things at the same time. And that's become popular because that appears in, you know, in games all the time and in, putting, in doing graphics. There's lots of, you know, updating of pixels where you can take advantage of that. So many of these machines have put those instructions, instructions in there. And of course, GPUs do it on a much larger scale. And again, you're, you're trusting the compiler to do it. So here is kind of a, a picture of what a vector processor looks like more at the hardware level. Here's two single registers, and a single add instruction would give you a single answer. And in the new one, you have a vector register, which may have 32 or 64. And then it will, in another vector register of another 32 arguments, and it will component by component do the additions. And it will do that in a pipeline fashion. So if it doesn't have 32 adders, it might only have two at a time. So it will just sort of walk its way across and, and do all those additions using whatever hardware is available. So as I said, this died out for a while, but now it's coming back. People are building very large machines this way. The question. What's the conceptual difference between vector architectures and SIMD? So, so, um, uh, so SIMD is sort of the general, SIMD is a general, you know, single instruction, multiple data. Vector is one uh, version of that. It sort of depends a little bit on where the data lives. So if you have individual instructions which can operate on uh, data sitting in registers and do many of them at the same time, that is, you know, a vector architecture. Sim, and that's a special case of SIMD. But you might also have processors that go out to memory and do many things at the same time. So do you want to? Uh, really, uh, semantically, it, they fit into the exact same paradigm. Uh, right. You know, we, we have different terminology that's come up just because. Right. This is historical. Do, it's historical. Words. Pentium yeah. didn't want to call it vector processing because they, everyone knew vector processing was dead. So they reintroduced <laughs> vector processing without calling it vector processing. And it's the same with the GPUs. So you know, no one at NVIDIA right. calls it vector yes. processing. So all the terminology for GPUs, will, we're, we're going to have a special lecture on GPUs later in the semester, but, and you'll have a chance to do some homework on it. Um, many, much of it is indeed SIMD, but they decided to invent different terminology, so we'll do some translating for you to make it clear what is the same. There's a whole chapter in Patterson's book now where he actually takes all the old terminology from vector processing right. and maps it all over to you know, NVIDIA's terminology. Right. So all the exact same terminology shows up again, but they thought that was confusing, so they 
they made a whole new language to describe this. But it's yes. the exact same right. execution model. Right. And, and so what I'm trying to do here is give you sort of the high level picture without worrying about the fact that one company has a different name for it than a different company. So, so, um, so as I was saying, the, the Cray has come back and is doing this. This is a, a few years old now. So this combines vector processors, but there's lots and lots of them. They're shared caches so that you can sort of, so there's parallelism at that level too. And you know, each, you know, so there are four processor nodes. And, uh, and, there's, and this particular machine supports the uh, uh, global address space so that instead of doing MPI, you can do puts and gets between the different processors. And one more sort of historical point of view, this was the fastest machine in the world for quite a, for like, oh, five years running, uh, the Earth Simulator uh, in Japan. And it had, if I recall correctly, 640 processors, each of which had 32 vector processors inside of it. It was a huge machine. And it, it took about a tennis court uh, to fill up. And they built a very special building and power supply for it and so forth. And I remember you know, being on a National Research Council committee writing a report on supercomputing when this machine was out there. And we realized that the time, the speed of light to get from one side of the machine to the other, since it occupied a tennis court, was about a tenth of a microsecond if you went along all the wires. So, so no, no matter what you, you know, you're never going to beat the speed of light. Right? So, so if you wanted to build a program that was going to require enough communication, that was going to be a lower bound. They were already at about 10 microseconds you know, because of all the software and other overhead to get across the machine. So they were getting very close to hard physical limits at building a machine this large. And that made it clear that you know, minimizing communication is going to be the most important thing as these machines scale up. OK, so that is the end of data parallel. And now I just want to say a little bit about hybrid, because real machines have everything in them. Everything that I've shown you shows up in the, in the biggest machines. And we have to deal with that. And so, uh, as I said, the, biggest, the machine you're going to be programming on Hopper, the, an individual node is a, uh, let's see, is it 6 or 12-way? It's a 12-way SMP, shared memory, multi-core. And there's hundreds of thousands of those all connected together. And, and there are other machines on the top 500 list which consist of that kind of architecture plus GPUs attached to each multi-core chip. So there's all different levels of complexity going on. And we have to deal with that because that's the way people build them. And you know, people invent funny names like clumps, clusters of SMPs to describe them. And, and you're going to be programming on that, as I said. And so what's the right programming model? And uh, there is no one best. This is sort of current research is what's the right thing to do. But there are two simple answers. One of them is just to assume the machine is flat. There's none of this hierarchy. Treat each core, each individual processor as a separate processor. It's a, it has an individual life, an MPI, and it sends messages everywhere, whether it's across the machine or to its neighbor, with, for whom it doesn't have to send mail. It can just talk to its neighbor, right? It's much faster, sharing memory with its neighbor. And the other alternative is to write programs which have all the levels of hardware exposed in the software. So you might write a shared memory program that runs on the 12 cores on, that are all connected in shared memory on Hopper. And, at that, and beyond that, you have to do message passing. You call sends and receives to talk to more distant ones. This makes coding painful, but if you want the peak speed in the machine, that's what you do. And of course, if there are extra graphics or game processors attached, then there's another level of stuff going on. And so um, people have been trying to address this. These global address space languages are one attempt. Because there you can refer to, as I said, S sub i. And it figures out, is S sub i your neighbor? And it goes there very fast. Or is S sub i on the other side of the machine? And it has to go through the network interconnect. And, and it will do that more slowly. But you know, you're writing the same code. But you still have to be aware of who's my neighbor and who's far away. And so um, for better or for worse, this is the way machines are being built right now. And there's a lot of research projects to try to hide it, but I don't see a way to hide it at the moment. So I have not mentioned GPUs or cloud computing so much. So I just want to have one more. We're going to have two lectures later in the semester, one on GPU programming and one on cloud computing. So I just want to tell you how they fit into this picture uh, that I've been trying, this sort of you know, taxonomy I've been trying to create for you. So GPU is really about data parallelism, about SIMD. But uh, most, progr and most programs have a mixture, right? They're, you're not just all adding you know, this 1,000-word array to this 1,000-word array, which GPUs can do very quickly for you. It's a mixture of sequential stuff and parallel stuff. And the people who build GPUs want you to be able to write code easily, which is that mixture. So in addition to all of that SIMD stuff, they do let you have threading. 
So you can have multiple threads going on. Each thread can do large array operations. And, uh, and, it, and the programming model, which works best for that in NVIDIA, is called CUDA. And as I said, we'll have a lecture on it. It's become so popular that people are trying to come up with a standard way of writing this kind of code, which will be portable across different GPUs. And that's called OpenCL. That's, you know, and many of the companies who build these things, uh, and also other companies who use them, like Apple, are trying to agree on what this language looks like. We'll have a lecture on it. It's still a work in progress. Now, what about cloud computing? That's where, like, you know, Amazon or, or, or Google or, or those kind of companies, you know, they have a few warehouses and they have on the order of 10,000 machines in them and they sell them, right? You can just sort of sign up with your credit card and you can have as many machines as you want, you know, for pennies per CPU minute or hour, whatever it is. And this was originally invented by them so they could do all of the web searching very quickly. But now it's a sort of commercially available, we can all use it. And the, mo the programming model is data parallelism because that's the simplest thing you can get 10 to the fifth machines to do all in parallel. And, and MapReduce is the software infrastructure that was, they invented for that. And it's very simple. You have a bunch of data spread across machines. You map it. That means you compute the, the same function of all of them. And then you reduce it, which means you compute the common <laughs> sum. And of course, it's not you know, computing functions and sums that you do when you do web search, but it can be broken down the same way. And that has become very popular. So much so that people have been uh, doing research in more flexible things than simply MapReduce. So Hadoop, and there's a longer list, and there's a whole research activity here at Berkeley. And we will, again, have a guest lecturer later in the semester who will tell you about what all of these different programming models look like. And if you want to do your project in, a clou in cloud computing, that's certainly fair game as well. We'll have those resources. OK. So this is the end of lecture three, which is the middle of lecture four. So there are sort of three hardware models to keep in mind when you ask yourself, how do I take my program and map it to, to a particular piece of hardware? There's shared memory. Everybody sees this data uh, you know, with, with the same addresses. Distributed memory, everybody has private data. And there's data parallel, where, which is you know, a different uh, axis, if you like, where you can do many of the same operations at the same time. And real machines are hybrids of all of these, and you just have to keep that into, in, you know, take that into account. And um, so what we have to do whenever we ask, come to one of these machines and we have an algorithm or an application, we want to map it, and that's the next lecture, what that's about, is we have to worry about how do I divide up my application into parts, which um, are, have, you know, are independent, as independent as possible. They don't have to talk to their neighbors very much. They don't have to synchronize very often. They're about equal in size. It's load balanced. Everybody's keeping equally busy. And, and, so, and they can spend a lot of time doing work on their local data before they have to talk to their neighbors. So there's good locality. So all of these architectures require it. They have different penalties and costs for doing it wrong. And the next lecture, you know, which I'll start right away, is how to identify parallelism and locality naturally in applications. It sort of comes up naturally from the kind of applications people want to run. So, but before I go there, are there any questions about this grand tour of architectures? So, yes, microphone, if it's a short one. Um, so, why did the vector um, model get phased out and then come back? So, why did the vector model get phased out and then come back is the question. So, uh, it, I think it's economics is a large part of the answer. People realize they could buy commodity really cheap. Commodity means cheap processors. Buy a bunch of them, wire them together, buy a, a cheap interconnect, and scale up to much larger parallelism than paying a, a specialty company like Cray to architect a very special hardware and you know, build all the chips themselves, which is very expensive, to make vector processing work. I think a lot of it had to do with economics. Now the economics has changed and people are building them again. I was but, um, about that question. Please. Um, yeah, the, at the time when this, uh, you know, the Beowulf clusters and all cl commodity computing work was going on, processor clock speeds are about 100 megahertz, 150 megahertz. You know, and networks are running at about, you know, one-tenth of that. You know, with all the shrinking of transistors and everything went faster, faster, faster. Moore's that, Law, yes. Moore's Law, that, 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 the chips got way faster, got much, much, much faster. Now they're up in the, up in the gigahertz range. The network didn't keep up. So now the, 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 the difference between how fast a processor goes and how fast your network goes just grew hugely. And that's really what pushed us to saying, you know, we need to actually use the silicon on the chip better. So that's where vector processors are coming back in again. So, so you talk about the vector uh, machine, so uh, like like GPU. So, like seems like there are many benefits you can get from GPU. What's the downside to use it? 
so, so there are certain uh, applications which are irregular, and we, you know, in our research group, we work on those all the time, um, which are not very efficient on GPUs. And, and be, because it is designed to do many th common activities at the same time very efficiently in parallel, but if parts of your code you know, are very irregular or sequential, then Amdahl's law you know, sort of bites you, because you know, they will execute it correctly, but they might slow down significantly. And not, so, so what people do then is that you have a CPU, which is you know, give, sending instructions to the GPU, so you have to divide your work between the CPU and the GPU, and that becomes a challenge too, because the time it takes to move data is, is a bottleneck again, and it's very slow to get data between the CPU and GPU. So there, yeah, it doesn't solve all problems yet. Uh, you, you also mentioned, say, there are uh, four machines in top 10, uh, 500. Uh, it's uh, cluster-based. So what other six? So, um, so, so the data I showed was from 2009. Yeah. And I think that uh, at that time was the Earth simulator may still have been on the top 500 list. I'd have to go look. And that was very much a vector architecture. Uh, that was special purpose built. They built that once. It was, you know, they're not going to build it again. But are you, are you seeing like the cluster based, uh, like high performance, uh, this kind of cluster would take over the, 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 the list? The, like well, is, um, it, it is, uh, let's see, the 2009 list, it was, you know, 80% of the top 500 were clusters in one form or another. And I, I, I'd have to go look again at the top five, the latest top 10 list. I think it's almost. I think it's all clusters now at some level, but, but it also consists of GPUs. They're all hybrids, right? So they may have GPUs running locally. People just build whatever it takes to, you know, whatever's the fastest thing available at the time. And that leads to hybrids. I see. So different countries, they build this kind of supercomputer. Do they review like the cost to build them? Uh, there are a lot of secrets here, <laughs> including there are probably lots of fast computers that are secrets that aren't on the list. Um, so, uh, the, the exact, this is a very competitive business, and not every. I mean, they will list. You know, we we bought this you know chip from this company and put that together. But uh, there's a lot of their own special sauce. You know, we have a special internet connect network that we built from scratch. Uh, I think that's true in the uh, Tianan A machine, uh, which is the latest, fastest machine at the top of the five uh, five hundred list. But uh, people will you know only build custom the part that they think they have a competitive advantage to, and everything else will be. Uh, uh, commodity. Off the shelf, yeah. The economics is, the is such that you have to do it that way. Yeah, it's, but it is the case that, you know, at the top is the hybrid machine. So you have a CPU and you have a GPU mm -hmm. and you have the CPU is a multi-core chips. Right. And it's always, usually several multi-core chips with several GPUs hanging <laughs> off it for every NIC. Right. And, and these become very hard to program. And, and some people say that, you know, this discourages everybody except the few ninja programmers who know how to program it and a very few codes that will actually get anywhere close to peak. And so there is this, you know, tension about making them easier to program as well as making them get to the top of the list, right, which is a different kind of competition. Right? Uh, what's the difference? Between oh, 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 can you rep sorry, maybe you can wait for the microphone there. <laughs> sorry. So what's the difference between distributed memory and data parallel? Well, distributed memory refers to the memory architecture that every processor has, you know, its own memory. And so when you, you know, when you do, you know, fetch location 37, that's a different location on every processor, as opposed to shared memory where 37 means the same location for every processor. Data parallel refers to the instructions that you're executing, not, not how the data is stored. And so one instruction may, you know, do many, many operations. Uh, so add means, you know, A plus B may mean add the matrix A to the matrix B, you know, all in parallel as many times, you know, with as much parallelism as possible. So there are two different dimensions of, of parallelism. Okay. So let me now hope that PowerPoint will let me go to the next lecture. All right, let me open it. While we're doing this, uh, I wasn't at my office hour this week. I was out of a strategic retreat, um, but I am today. And if you don't have a NERSC account made up yet, then I'll need you to fill this part out, like I talked about in the first lecture, and bring it to me. 
please try to print your name quite clearly. I have to actually type that into a computer, and then you're going to make up your username based on what I thought you write, you wrote. And the nurse, when the end, won't care, but if you end up, you might be known forever in the Department of Energy by the name I mistype your name in as. <laughs> and it's quite hard to change your name in the system. So print clearly. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So, you may, so uh, in the last lecture, uh, in the last time I spoke, I said you should think of using these machines in a, as a sequence of layers. At the very top, you have an application that you want to decompose into parts, all of which can be done in parallel. Each part then requires an algorithm, a clever algorithm that runs in parallel. That is going to be implemented in some kind of software, and that's going to be the, then be mapped on some kind of hardware. So these four layers, applications, mapped to algorithms, mapped to software, mapped to hardware. We're now going to go to the very top layer and talk about... Uh, the applications, and I'm going to try to talk about them again and put them in sort of a taxonomy, categorize patterns that show up over and over again in applications in the form of simulation, so scientific applications for the most part, and uh, say where the parallelism in shows up inherently. So, uh, so in fact, it's not just parallelism I want to show, you know, describe where it comes up, it's data locality, right? Because we want to minimize communication, so they're both critical to figuring out which processor does which subset of the work. And the good news is that real-world problems na very naturally have both parallelism and locality built into them. And, and the kind of patterns that show up are that many objects operate independently of one another. So if you imagine a bunch of you know, billiard balls rolling around until they touch, right? They're all independent, so there's natural parallelism there. Objects often depend much more on nearby objects than on distant ones. That will help us decide which processor gets to work on what. And again, billiard balls is the simplest example because uh, until you touch and you're very close, you know, there's no interaction, so you can all be independent. And, and the last example uh, of, is that if something is far away, it gets much simpler. And you can sort of change the mathematics of the algorithm so that things that are far away can be approximated and you don't have to communicate with them very much at all. And so, so gr particles moving under gravity sort of illustrate all three, and I'll be using that. So as, you know, par each particle is moving independently, right? You can do, the, you can do F equals MA. You, you can move each particle independently of all the others. When, when, if you're trying to compute the force on a particle due to gravity, the nearby par particles, you've got to know where they are so that you can compute the forces correctly. But if they're particles that are really far away, so suppose you want the force of gravity on the Earth due to everything in the universe, you're moving it around, and one of those things in the universe is the Andromeda galaxy. So there are a billion stars in the Andromeda galaxy. Do you need a billion terms in your sum for that? No, you can approximate the Andromeda galaxy by a point mass. It's a very good approximation. And you know, for, if you're in the Andromeda galaxy, the Milky Way looks like a point mass. And if you do that systematically, the cost of these algorithms goes down asymptotically. And so you just have to think of new algorithms to do that. And it minimizes both the amount of arithmetic you have to do and the amount of communication. And everybody runs in parallel. So, so those kind of patterns appear over and over again. And I want to talk about them here. I, I, I can't do all of the mathematics today. I'm just giving you a tour. There'll be later lectures where we go back and talk about how the algorithms actually work. And then, in addition to the real world having natural parallelism and locality, when you write down a model, you know, a mathematical scientific model of it, you often get more parallelism. So in particular, if you're trying to move things around, again, those, those balls that are bouncing, you're going to do it at discrete time steps. So time t equal 1, t equal 2, t equals 3. And, and that makes, gives you even more parallelism because if you're only going to take you know, a time step from t equal 1 to t equal 2, that tells you how many neighbors you could possibly have to look at who are possibly, could possibly have a collision for you, right? Because if they're far enough away, in one second, they're not going to touch you. And so that helps you identify more parallelism in there. And, um, and so and the other point I want to make in the next slide is that many problems have this, all these kind of different parallelism at, at different levels of simulation. So, um, so here are going to be the four categories in my taxonomy that show up to sort of recognize parallelism. And the simplest one is called discrete event systems. In that case, all the objects, you, know, you have a discrete set of objects that you're simulating, and time is discrete. Everything moves forward at, at discrete time steps. And so the game of life, if you ever played that game, it was in you know, Scientific American a long time ago, you have a square grid. Every square grid is either uh, occupied or not occupied, and depending on how many of your neighbors are occupied or not, you know, you're either dead or alive in the next, next time step. 
uh, manufacturing systems work the same way. If you're trying to simulate a conveyor belt in a, in, a, in, a, in a factory and what's being manufactured, that's also a discrete event as it moves along and you can decide, write down a model of how fast things go through your factory depending on how you build it. Finance is, sim is similar. Uh, circuits, uh, when people do circuit simulations, it can be at the discrete level because you have gates and transistors and there's a clock and so things happen to discrete events. And of course there's some old computer games like Pac-Man that work that way. So the next level up in this taxonomy is I'm going to make it a little bit more continuous. And I'm going to talk about particle systems. And I've already alluded to that. So billiard balls moving around. It's discrete in the sense that you still have a discrete set of particles, but now time is continuous. And galaxies, atoms, you know, moving around under gravity or moving around with electrostatic forces. Again, a discrete set of things, but the time is continuous. And I have circuits here twice. That's because there's different ways of simulating circuits. And if I'm following electrons around in a, in a circuit, I may simulate it this way. And if I'm just you know, worrying about where the gates and you know, the transistors on or off, then that's a discrete event system. And, I'm, and actually, circuits show up all the time. And I will show some more examples of circuits. And of course, pinball is yet another computer game that adds in that. It has t continuous time. So the next part of the taxonomy are called lumped variables depending on continuous parameters. And if you've ever had a class in ODEs, ordinary differential equations, it's precisely that kind of model. So in that case, again, I have a discrete set of variables, but they depend continuously, you know, as, as a function of time, on whoever they're connected to by the set of differential equations. So structural mechanics, you write down a set of equations, you know, you have beams in a building, they're all connected to one another, you know, at corners. So you can sort of write down F equals MA for all of the discrete points in the building, and you can you know, simulate that forward. That's a, you know, many of you work in that. Uh, chemical kinetics is another example. You have a discrete set of variables, densities, and they uh, simulate forward in time. And circuits. So if anybody's ever used the system SPICE, you, know, you, you write down you know, the voltages and the uh, currents at different points in a circuit, and they all depend as a function of time on one another, and you simulate it forward. And there's another computer game, working up the chain, Star Wars, The Force Unleashed. That run, that's a highly parallel uh, 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 game that does all the structural mechanics. So when Darth Vader smashes something, it's actually solving the structural mechanics to get it to look right. And I'll, I'll show you that later. So, and then the last piece of this taxonomy is everything is continuous. So continuous variables depending on continuous parameters. And if you've ever had a class in partial differential equations, that's sort of what I have in mind. And so if you want to write down and model heat, uh, or elasticity or electrostatics, you know, that varies continuously as a function of where you are, the temperature, and it also varies continuously as a function of time. Now, of course, when you actually go to solve it, you have to do it at discrete points in time and discrete points in space, but you get a common set of parallel computing problems out of them, no matter which one of these you try to solve. Uh, circuits show up again because I can write down a very low-level model of circuits where I'm actually worrying about you know, the Schrodinger equation, if I really want to simulate circuits at that level. And medical image analysis, and then yet another uh, piece of the entertainment industry, a movie called Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, did very detailed parallel modeling of fluid splashing around, including blood, I think, and, and you know, as, P, as you know, our former governor was smashing things. Okay. So, um, so the point is a given phenomenon can be you know, modeled at multiple levels, and so you may choose to uh, simulate something where you have a mixture of some discrete events, you may have some continuous events, and so you have to be able to compose all these things as well. And there's a website for more on simulation and games, but I'll, I'll show you a video either today or tomorrow or the next time. Um, there's also an important difference between this particular simulation and this particular simulation besides one being lumped variables and the other being continuous variables. Uh, this one was developed at Stanford and that one was developed at Berkeley. So that's also an interesting distinction. So, so here is an example of circuits, one simulation problem, which can be done in all different ways. And, and I sort of have these sorted in order from the most discrete version down to the most continuous version. And um, so this is the level at which you might simulate the circuit. These are sort of the primitive operations which appear in your simulation. And these are widely used pieces of simulation software that people actually use to do this in practice. So if you have a, you know, a computer circuit, you could sort of simulate it at the instruction level. You know, each add operation or load operation you know, is a primitive. We know what it does. And we can write down a simulator which says this is what your potential design of a new microprocessor is going to do. 
Now, an instruction is built out, you know, takes usually several cycles, especially if you're going to memory. So, and it's running, you know, and it uses several, you know, sub pieces of the hardware, functional units, there's adders, multipliers, registers. And so you may simulate at that level, it's a slightly more, it's still discrete, but it's another level of detail. And of course, these, uh, these functional units are built themselves out of, you know, much lower level objects called, uh, you know, registers and muxes and counters. And so you could do the simulation at that level. You could go all the way down to gates, you know, flip-flops and so forth. Uh, and then switches. This is sort of the end of the discrete level. So now I just have transistors that are on or off. And that's yet another level of simulation. Below that, people need to know, is this thing going to melt? And for that, they have to actually, you know, simulate all the, the voltages and, and, and currents in it. And so they will actually write down, you know, a description with resistors and capacitors and inductors of everything. That turns into almost an ordinary differential equation. It's actually slightly more general. It's a differential algebraic equation because some of the equations have derivatives and some don't. So, so, but people still need to solve that. That's typically done by SPICE, which was again invented at Berkeley a long time ago. And if you really want to go below that, of course, you have Schrodinger's equation and whatever you want. So uh, you may choose one thing to simulate, but you may you know, paralyze it at all sorts of different levels. So the outline then of this next lecture is I'm going to walk through all of these and give examples and how the parallelism naturally arises in this order from discrete event to particle to ODEs to PDEs. And if I'm lucky, I will get through the end of ODEs today, but we'll see. But certainly I'll do PDEs next time. So we have built over time a bunch of illustrative software to, to show you all of these as model problems without having to you know, understand all the underlying physics that may appear in a particular problem. And we call them sharks and fish. And they're all posted on the web page. And the idea is that you have sharks and fish living in an ocean. And there are different versions of it posted on the web page and implemented in different parallel programming languages. So there's the discrete versions where the sharks and the fish live at different mesh points. And they have rules for who eats whom or who swims away from whom um, for breeding and eating. And there's forces, right? There's currents in the ocean. Uh, and there's you know, attractions and repulsions between creatures, right? The sharks are attracted to the fish, and the fish aren't attracted to the sharks. Um, and so we have this implemented in six different ways. And you can see all of the different languages in which we've implemented it, including some ones of only historical interest, because, well, we've taught this class for a while, and these machines ex don't exist anymore. And some of your homework will depend on it. But if you're interested in seeing illustrations of all these different kinds of things and asking yourself how to parallelize them, you can you know, look at sharks and fish one, which is if they're only fish, no sharks, and every they're all just swimming around according to Newton's laws and some external current. Uh, we will have an assignment that looks like that. Um, actually, we will, the fish will have, um, uh, actually, inter, there will be interfish forces in the homework assignment. I, re, I recall now, we're, there, you know, the fish will know who the neighboring fish are and will be repelled from them. And so you'll get a slightly more interesting simulation to paralyze. That's homework assignment number three, I think. Um, and then there's the game of life, and there's all these different versions. So you, you can go look at those if you if you like, for concrete examples of what I'm about to talk about. So let's start with discrete event systems. So these, the systems are represented as a finite list of variables. Um, each variable has a, has, a, has a particular value at each point in time. And we only care about the, the set of all the values. That's called the state at time t equals 0, t equals 1, t equals 2. Everything's discrete, time and the values. And there's a function called the transition function, which says, if I want to know the value of this variable at time t equal 1, I need, I need some data at time t equals 0. I compute the function that tells me my new value at t equals 1. So you can imagine this works in circuits and all sorts of other things. There are two different categories which are going to affect how we parallelize them. Some of these systems are synchronous, and some of them are asynchronous. So synchronous means that there really is a clock. And everybody, you know, we start at time t equals 0. At time t equal 1, everybody looks at the data at time t equals 0 and takes a step forward. To get t equal 2, we take a step forward synchronous. Everybody moves at the same time. But in the real world, there are a lot of things that don't work quite that way, but they're still discrete event systems. So we call them asynchronous. And in that case, you don't know when you're going to change because it, you know, if your neighbor never changes, you're never going to change, right? Because you depend, let's suppose you only depend on your neighboring values. And so you will only take a step and, and change your state when your neighbors do. And that there may not be a clock which causes that to happen, or, or there, there may or may not be a clock. So but the, you, don't make it, uh, you don't actually do any work unless there's a change in your inputs. And so that's why it's called asynchronous. And so the game of life works that way. 
Um, this is sharks and fish number three. And so the all of space is divided into cells. Each cell is either occupied by a fish or not. And there are rules that govern you know, whether this uh, fish is going to be alive, whether it's going to starve and die, or whether a fish is going to be born in the next step. So let's talk about that one first. And this is going to be the synchronous case. The synchronous case is much easier to think about. So I'm going to have a grid, and each grid is going to have, you know, it's, it's you know, going to be labeled at each mesh point, you know, dead or alive, fish or not. And I'm going to have two copies of the grid, the old one, you know, a time step t, and the new one, a time step t plus one. And when I simulate, I only need two copies of the grid, because what I'm going to do is ping pong back and forth. I'll have the old values, and then I'll update the, the new values in the other grid. Then I'll take the values in the new grid, and I'll use them to update the old values. So I'll just keep going back and forth. So as I'm, to move forward, I only need two copies, right? I don't have to, you know, have n copies to take n steps. And so, and I only need, because you, I only depend on my neighbors. So, you know, and if I think of a two-dimensional grid, how many neighbors do I have? I have eight neighbors, you know, north, south, east, and west, and then the four corners. So I only need to talk to a few elements. I don't have to talk to distant ones. And so the question is, how do I... You know, and suppose I have a square grid. Here's my big square grid. And suppose I have nine processors. What work do I assign to each of my nine processors to do it? Each one is going to get a subset of the grid points to do. And the most natural thing to do is, is simply to divide my big physical domain into nine subsquares. And I've labeled them here. Processor one gets that square up in that corner. Processor five gets that square. And so this, uh, this very simple pattern here, which is easy with squares, uh, d you divide the physical domain into pieces, as many pieces as you have processors, and each processor gets a subdomain. That's called domain decomposition. And so at a very high level, the code is going to look like this. I'm going to repeat until I've taken as many time steps as I want. I'm going to compute all of the stuff I can do locally. So if all my neighbors are, are on the same processor, I, need everything I, need to, I, have, I know everything I need in order to take one time step. But if I'm right on the edge, I need to know something in the other processor. And so what I'm going to do is exchange data with my neighbors. So I need to search just for the guys on the border. I'll have a more detailed picture soon. I need to communicate. So processor 6 needs to talk to processor 3. So processor 6 knows who's alive or dead right on the border in order to do those updates. So how am I going to make sure that these, I get consistent information? Well, I'm going to do all my local computations where I don't have to talk to anybody. I'm going to, then I'm going to wait till everybody else is done. There's a special subroutine for that. It's called a barrier. And everybody's going to ex every thread is going to execute that instruction, and everybody stops until everybody's gotten that far, until everybody's executed that same function, then everybody keep, is allowed to keep on going. At that point, you know everybody's been updated locally. Then I can do my communication, get my data, exchange my information with my neighbors. So P3 will send his neighboring data to P6 and vice versa, and then I keep on going. And so this is great for locality. Most of the time, when I do my computation, I only uh, need data that's stored locally on P6. The only time I need to communicate is when I'm on the boundary. And so the boundary is a lot smaller than the interior of the domain. So this is a good way to minimize communication. Here, I've picked the shapes of these domains kind of intuitively, right? I have this big thing, and I have nine processors, so I divide it into nine squares. There are obviously a lot of ways to divide things into nine pieces. Which is the best way to do it? So how do, how do I pick the shapes of these things? I just pick them as squares, which seemed kind of intuitive. But if I don't have squares, or if I don't have, you know, talking to my nearest neighbors, life gets much more complicated. So let me try to formalize how I figure out what the shapes of those domains are supposed to be. But, but let me start again with a graph. And so I'm gonna, it's going to be an n by n mesh. Everybody's talking to their nearest neighbors. It just the, in fact, just the north, south, east, and west neighbors, to make it easy. And to draw the picture, I'm just going to, so here's my grid of 18 uh, by 18 mesh points. And I want to assign these to nine processors. So somehow I want to take all these mesh points and assign them to nine processors. So there are two obvious ways to do it. One of them is just to assign it by rows. So here I have nine processors, and they all have different colors. So the red processor gets the first two rows, and then the blue processor gets the next two rows. That's an easy thing to do. And then there's this other way to do it, which I had in the previous slide, which is each processor gets a subsquare. So the question is, which one of these is better? This one looks easier, right? It's kind of natural. I only have to look at one direction, and I just divide it up evenly. So each of these gives an equal number of mesh points to each processor. So the amount of arithmetic is the same. But what I want to know is which one has less communication. So let me count how much the algorithm would have to communicate here 
versus how much the algorithm they have to communicate here. So how do I figure out communication? Every time there's an edge connecting one color to another, that represents communication. I have to send this data, you know, the state of that point over here in order to update the state of that point. So every line that connects two different colors is a communication. So I'm just going to count the edges that connect different colors. And I'll do that here, and I'll do that here. And if you, and if you do it for a general n and p, it's pretty easy to see. Here I have n edges, there I have n edges, there I have n edges. And so I have a total of n times p minus 1 edges, if I do it that way. And if you do the same arithmetic on this guy, it's also proportional to n, but it's now the square root of p. And if p is large, the square root of p is a heck of a lot smaller than p. And so this one wins. And this is the right way to do it. And the language that we're going to use to describe this process is uh, minimizing the surface to volume ratio. Right? So the, the surface is, if you like, the, the, the edges. That's how much I have to communicate. And the volume, or the stuff inside, that's the amount of work that I have to do that's local, that requires no communication. And so this, a square, has a much smaller surface to volume ratio than a long, skinny rectangle. And this is all obvious when I am only talking to my four nearest neighbors, but it gets much more complicated if I have arbitrary connectivity. OK. So, so now let me go to one more level of complexity, where I'm not just talking to my four nearest neighbors, but I have a kind of an arbitrary circuit. Right? If, if, I'm, if I'm building a circuit, anybody could be wired to anybody else. I still want to solve the same problem, which is to give about an equal amount of work to every processor and minimize the number of edges that connect one processor to another so they don't have to communicate very much. So I'm going to use this language, which you may be familiar with, but it's, it's a sort of a common mathematical language. I'm going to model everything as a graph. A graph consists of a bunch of vertices, points, and connected by edges. And, and so that's just sort of a, a simple way to describe things. So each vertex is some computation I have to do. And each edge that connects two vertices represents some data that has to be moved from, to, from this computation to do the next one. And so uh, the previous ones, I was just connected to my north, south, east, and west neighbors. And so what I want to do is ask, given such a graph, and here I've drawn a picture. So here are my eight vertices. And the edges represent who has to send data to whom. And what I want to do is partition it onto, in this case, four processors. I want to take this graph, and I want to partition it and assign the partitions to different processors. And so the question is, what's the best way to do it? It's, squares are not so obvious anymore. And so what are, what are my goals? What are my metrics of success? I want to be very parallel, and I want to minimize communication. So I want to have about an equal amount of work assigned to each processor. I want it to be load balanced. So every processor should get about an equal number of vertices. And here it is. Everybody got two. And my second goal is to minimize the number of edge crossings that cross between one partition and the next, because that's counting how much data is sent around. So, and for meshes, it was easy. I did squares. And it turns out that if I write down an arbitrary graph with arbitrary connections, that problem is famous. It's called the graph partitioning problem. And it's known to be incredibly hard. It's something called NP-hard. That means that any known algorithm that solves it costs like 2 to the n. I mean, so much more expensive than your original problem, you'll, you never want to do it. And that's just the inherent nature of it. But that's OK. There are a lot of approximations <laughs> that are perfectly good that get you close. And we'll do those instead. And there's a whole big theory of those later lecture. But let's just look at this simple example here. So here I have two possible partitions. And the question is, which one is better? Well, they're both load balanced, right? Every partition here, which I've indicated by these you know, uh, 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 colored boxes, everybody has two. So what I want to do is count the number of edge crossings. And here, there's 2 plus 2 plus 2. There's 6. And here, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There are 10. Right? So this one is the winner. And uh, we, could have we did this one by hand. But if you have an arbitrary graph with arbitrary connectivity, as I said, this problem suddenly becomes this combinatorial nightmare and that we can only afford to solve approximately in a later lecture. So, but yeah, that's the goal, to come up with partitions that are good. And that one wins. OK, so, so that's one problem that we'll come back to. And in fact, this problem of graph partitioning is going to come up in all the other problems we have to solve, too. So this is the first illustration, if you like, of this common underlying combinatorial problem that comes up over and over again. OK, so now let me make the problem a little bit more general, and we'll see another issue that comes up. And so suppose this is what my sharks and fish simulation looks like. So I have. Uh, a whole, you know, a bunch of 
three pawns, if you like, or let's say you can think of three circuits where everything's tightly connected. And then I have some kind of very skinny connections to some other parts. So you could think of this as three pawns with fish, or this is one tightly connected circuit, one functional unit with everybody's talking to everybody, and then there's just one wire connecting it to some other functional unit. Okay? And so what I'd like to do is parallelize this. This is, this is sort of a graph where some things are densely connected and some things are loosely connected. And so it seems like a pretty natural thing. One processor does this, one processor does that, another processor does this, and then they only have to pay attention to this little bit of communication over there. So, and, and while the fish are all swimming around in the middle, probably nothing is happening along that edge. Nobody's going to swim out through that little edge. And so for most of the time, these three pawns, these three processors can work completely independently. I'd like to take advantage of that. I don't want to have to ask, has somebody come across this, this little, you know, uh, rivulet every time step? Because that's too slow. And so there's a different style of, si of simulation that, takes, that tries to deal with this. It's called asynchronous simulation. So the synchronous one is that every time step I asked, has the data changed? What do I do? In the asynchronous case, I'm not going to bother doing that. I'm only going to get the data when it changes, because it may not change very frequently at all. And so another word for this is called, is, is called event-driven simulation. I'm only going to update things when an event occurs. That means I get some data from my neighbor on whom I depend that causes something to change. So there's no global time steps anymore. There's no t equal 1, t equal 2. But everybody comes with a timestamp. When did I change? And then you can use that to decide what am I supposed to do with it. And so one example was a previous slide, you know, loosely connected pawns. Uh, maybe a little bit more interesting is circuit simulation, where I have delays in the circuit. You know, and two circuits may not talk to one another very often, but occasionally some bits will be sent across. And another example is traffic simulation. And there, time is continuous, and the events are cars changing lanes and so forth, and people use this for doing, for doing that kind of simulation. So this can be much, much more efficient, but it's going to be much trickier to parallelize, uh, because how do you you know, know when your something has changed, right? You don't want to, the whole point of this was not to open your mailbox every time step and look, right? So if, if you were thinking in MPI, you know, in message passing, you know, an event is very naturally uh, done by send as a message, right? You send a message to your neighbor when something has changed, um, but how do you know when to open your mailbox? How do you know when to do a receive? So there are two answers. There's a conservative way to do it and a speculative way to do it. And the conservative way says you're only going to simulate up to the latest, uh, the minimum timestamp of any input. So if you have all of your data from your neighbors and everybody has told you what they are is of state time 10 or later, you know, somebody's good up to 10, another buddy's good up to 11, you know that you can simulate up to time 10, right? Because all the information from your neighbors is up to date up to time 10. So you can imagine what the, what the code would look like. I won't write it down. You know, get all the data from my neighbors, take the minimum of all their timestamps, and simulate that far ahead. Now the trouble is, you get a deadlock. And so you have to cleverly avoid deadlocks. I'll show you how to do that in the next slide. And, and, and people build things this way. So there's a circuit simulator that they built at Stanford a while ago that works that way. And the other way is to just be an optimist that you won't get the wrong answer. Go ahead, simulate ahead, ignore your neighbors, every once in a while check on them. Now what happens if you simulated ahead to time 20 and a neighbor shows up and says, oh, I changed something back at time 10? You gotta back up. And so what you have to do is save enough information that you can back up a ways and start over again, a little bit, right? So if, you, if you're willing to uh, you know, simulate five steps ahead, speculate that nothing's gonna happen for five steps, then you have to save the inf your, your last state from five steps ago. And you might have to back up that far. So, um, and there are other simulators that are built that way. Um, and so this takes, obviously, you know, if you guess wrong too often, you're, it'll be less efficient, uh, but you won't have these uh, deadlocks and sequential bottlenecks uh, that I'll show you on the next slide. So there is no one best way to do it, which is why I have to tell you about both. Um, so, so let me give you an example of how this goes into deadlock. And so here are the three pawns. And let's suppose, you know, so I have fish swimming in there, there, and there. And let's suppose, for simplicity, that uh, they can only swim around in this uh, counterclockwise direction. So let's suppose now that all the fish have been simulated up to time t naught, and everybody's in sort of in the middle of their ponds. They're swimming around. They've, they're updated up to time t naught. 
but they're nowhere near the edges. So no signal has been sent that something has changed. This guy didn't send anything to him because the fish is in the middle and so forth. What happens? Everybody's waiting. Can I simulate ahead? But they can't, right? Because they, they've simulated up to time t naught, and none of their neighbors have given them any new information. So they can't go to t naught plus 1, and everybody's stuck, right? So, so what do you do about it? That's called a deadlock. Okay. So what do you do about it? Well, you wait for a while, and then you send a message to your neighbor which says, are you stuck? And if you ever get a message like that, you forward it to your neighbor. Are you stuck? Are you stuck? And eventually, if that message comes back to you, if your own message comes back to you and says, are you stuck? Then you know you're stuck. And then everybody just takes a step forward. Okay? So that is how you have to break the deadlock there. But you can imagine if this happens too often, it's a bad thing. <laughs> right? It's a very sequential kind of bottleneck. And so there is no one best answer. Okay, so let me just, that's the end of discrete event simulation. So let me just sort of summarize it. So everything in this world is discrete. You know, space is discrete and time is discrete. We're going to decompose the world so that every processor gets about an equal amount of work to do. And I'm going to try to do that by minimizing communication, run some sign of graph partitioner. And so each component is going to be simulated ahead. I can either do it synchronously. There's a clock. Everybody takes a time step at the same time. And the other way to do it is asynchronous because the changes don't happen very often. So you just wait until it, you know, an event occurs. And you can either be conservative and don't go off any farther ahead than the latest information you've gotten permits you to go. But in that case, you have to do deadlock detection. And otherwise, you're speculative. You're greedy. You just go ahead, but you have to back up, roll back if necessary. So, that's the end of discrete event simulation. Any questions before I go on to particles? Okay. So here's the next level of, of uh, simulation, particles. So it's discrete in the sense that I have a finite number of particles. They're all moving around. And the simplest example that I'll use, Newton's law. So they're all, you know, they're all doing F equals MA and moving ahead. It could be something different. And time is continuous. And so there's lots and lots of examples there. Um, so there's stars in space moving under gravity, uh, electron beams. You know, when people do you know, build uh, new uh, fab lines in Silicon Valley, they may do a simulation where they you know, are trying to figure out, am I going to etch my chips very accurately? Uh, you know, molecular dynamics, neutrons in the fission reactor, you know, games and so forth. I still will, hopefully I'll get to show you the video of this game. And so uh, let's see how these things simulate. So it turns out that the most important thing to do is to compute the force in each particle. So then you can do F equals MA, you can figure out the acceleration, everybody moves forward. And it turns out there are three different kinds of forces, and they're paralyzed in three very different ways. There's external forces. That means, for example, there's an external, if you're a fish in the ocean, there's a current. Everybody feels the current the same way, it just depends on where you are. You don't have to talk to anybody, there's just a function you evaluate. There's, there's a function of your position, and that tells you what the current is. And so, and if you have an externally imposed electric field, that'll tell you know, each electron in the beam will feel that, and that's easy to paralyze. Everybody just evaluates a function. The next kind of force, it's a little bit harder, is where it only depends on your nearest neighbors. So you may, sharks may be attracted to eat nearby fish, you know, fish that are far away it doesn't pay attention to. If bill, billiard balls, so it only depends on when you really collide with one another, and so that's a very nearby force. And then there's something called van der Waals forces in chemistry, and these are actually far field forces. They decrease like one over the distance to the sixth power. But that decreases so fast that basically you just ignore it after a while. And um, one of our colleagues here uh, actually believes this is how gecko feet work when they crawl around in the ceiling and they glue one another. You know, they can walk on anything and sort of stick and unstick, and it all comes down to van der Waals forces, if you want to read about that. And the most challenging one to uh, simulate is where everybody depends on everybody else. So far field forces, gravity, electrostatics, things that obey, uh, typically obey one over r squared laws. But these are all governed, you know, in the physics of it, there's, an, there's a partial differential equation like Laplace's equation, the Poisson equation, that sort of describe how all of these forces work. And these are the most challenging because everybody depends on everybody. And that's where we have to have more clever algorithms to avoid doing, well, if I have n particles and everybody depends on everybody, the obvious algorithm is cost you n squared, right? Because everybody has to talk to everybody else. We will have algorithms for many of these common forces that work in time n. So you can compute, even though everybody depends on everybody, you can still do it in linear time. And that requires taking into account that things that are far away look simple. Okay, 
So here, let's, let's go back to the simplest case and sort of work our way through these kind of forces. So here is correct MATLAB code, which is all you need to, to solve this problem. So I'm going to have an array of fish positions. Um, so you know, fish sub 1, fish sub 2, that's the position, is a single complex number. So x and y tells me where the fish is. I have an array of the velocities. Again, a single number, single complex number. I have, uh, an array of the masses. I want to simulate from t equals 0 up to t final. And my algorithm is going to be the simplest thing of all. If I know my velocity and I take a little time step, I know how to update my position. You know, position equals position plus you know, delta t times the velocity. And I can update the acceleration the same way by a little, little time step. So I'm going to take little time steps uh, of time t equals uh, uh, 1 one hundredth of a second, starting at time equals 0. And while the time is less than t final, I'll update my time step. I'll update my positions. It's, it's the formula. I just take my time step times the velocity and add that to my current position, nice and parallel. Then, since this is an external field, all I need to do, know is where I am, and I can compute the current. So there's some function called current, which tells me, depending on where I am, which way is the water flowing. So that's all embarrassingly parallel. And so I do acceleration equals force divided by mass. There's the f equals ma. Then I update the velocity, the same formula, velocity plus delta t times acceleration. And so I'd be done, except that I have to make sure that I don't step too far or not far enough. So I'm going to update my time step by saying that, well, I don't, I don't want to take you know, a very big time step, because if I do, I might get a really inaccurate answer. So how am I going to decide how small my time step should be? They're very sophisticated decisions. Here's the simplest idea. I'm going to make sure that I don't change my acceleration by more than 10% at every time step. I'm not willing to you know, change my acceleration a lot. And so what I need to do is take the largest fish velocity, so take the max of the absolute values of all the fish velocities, and divide that by the max of acceleration times 0.1. And so basically, this is communication here, right? I haven't done any communication yet until this line of code. I have to get compute all of these numbers and take their max. So that's a reduction operation. So there's the communication, the, which isn't very much. OK, so let's talk about how to parallelize this. This is certainly the simplest case. Uh, the, it's all embarrassingly parallel. Everybody can evaluate the current function locally. And uh, this is what MapReduce does in cloud computing world. Everybody computes a single function, and then I just you know, add it to everybody. So I can distribute the particles to the processors any way I like. Any distribution works. Locality is trivial. There's no communication. I just have to make sure each processor gets an equal number of particles. So that's easy to, to do. And it's not you know, any real constraint on the rest of the problem. OK. So let's go now to the next harder thing, which is nearby forces. We're only depending on my neighbors. And, and, the, and the, the worst thing you could do is say, well, I don't know who's close to me. So at every time step, I'm going to look at every other particle, all n of them, and ask, are you close enough? And that would cost me n squared. That's a bad idea. So again, I'm going to use the trick of domain decomposition. I'm going to divide up space. and each pr So here I have divided up space into 25 different regions. And each processor is going to get a different region. So why is that good? So now I know that if I need to know, ask, are there any possible collisions between, between particles in this processor and the neighbor, well, I only have to talk to my few nearest neighbors. I know there can't be any collisions between these guys and these guys because they're too far away. So I only have, again, to talk to my nearest neighbors to decide, is there going to be a collision or not? So here's sort of the picture of what happens. So everybody is assigned you know, a square, of, and they, they own all the particles inside that square. And so this guy is in the center of the square, so I know he's not going to collide with anybody in any other neighbor. I only have to check maybe these two guys, local stuff. But he is so close to the boundary, if there was somebody else close to the boundary in the neighboring processor, there could be a collision. So again, all I have to do is take all the particles that are close to the boundary. You know, this is the surface-to-volume ratio stuff. All I have to do is take the particles near the surface and communicate them to my neighbors because they're the only possible sources of, of a collision. And so all the ideas about how do I minimize communication that we did in the discrete case apply here, too. I'm trying to minimize the surface-to-volume ratio. OK. So, so this is a perfectly natural thing to do when all the particles are evenly distributed, you know, just divided up into nice squares. But in, real, in the real world, the particles are not going to be equally distributed everywhere. Right? There might be clusters. And so, that, that, so I will not get a good load balance. I mean, already here, I get a lot of idle processors. right? So what am I going to do about it? I'm going to divide up space using a different idea. It's still going to be squares. 
or square-like. But I'm going to use an idea called quad trees. So here's, here's how it's going to work. So suppose these dots are my particles. They all live in the big square. So I'll start by dividing the big square into four smaller ones. And I'll look inside each square and say, well, how many guys are inside of you? There are only two in here. It's not worth dividing this square any, any smaller. But this one has lots and lots of particles in it, so I better divide it, continue dividing it up. So I'll divide it into four squares. No worth, it's not worth dividing these anymore, two, three, and zero. There's, nothing, there's not enough work there. This one keeps getting divided, and I keep doing recursively dividing the squares until there are only a few left, you know, until there's some maximum number of particles in any square. So then I can take all of these. So each of these squares is about an equal amount of work. Since they're squares, I've sort of minimized the surface-to-volume ratio. And now I can go assign these subsquares to processors to try to you know, you know, do the load balancing. And of course, you know, I'd like to assign these four subsquares to one processor if, if possible you know, to avoid communication. This is the picture I've drawn in two dimensions. You can, uh, there's a question. And, and uh, let me just say, I could have drawn the picture in three dimensions. They're called octrees trees because you get you know, eight cubes at every level. So as time went by, do you need to redivide the squares again? So as, as time goes by, it depends. So the hope is, as you're doing the simulation and you're taking small time steps, the particles will move slowly enough that you can keep this distribution for a while. And if a particle crosses the, the, uh, a barrier between one square and another, you just give it to your neighbor. And so over time, the load balance will get worse. And every once in a while, you have to redivide them. But for a, a number of time steps, you just let them cross the barrier and, and hope for the best. So, again, there, there are there's no one best answer to do it, so that's why there's lots of algorithms. Any other questions? OK, so I think that's a good place to stop. The next uh, and most challenging topic is the far field forces, where everybody depends on everybody. OK, um, we, we are being asked. So we have two different ways to communicate with one another. We have Piazza and Google Groups on the web page. And we should do Piazza. No, we, we were abandoning Google Groups. <laughs>